Hey everyone, we are so excited that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. Now, whether you're in person or online, we would encourage you to download the YouVersion app. Our church uses this app as a Sunday morning resource for you to follow along during the service. And even if you'd still like to use your hard copy Bible, YouVersion is a great tool to follow along with the sermon notes. So here's a quick walkthrough of how to access the app and what it offers. Once you've downloaded the YouVersion app, go ahead and open it. Click the More tab. And from there, you'll want to click Events. Once you've done that, you will see all of the local churches who use YouVersion, including South Salem. You can also search South Salem Church of the Nazarene. After choosing our church, remember to hit the save button so that you can quickly access our church during future services. Now that you're on our page, you'll be able to view sermon notes and the sermon scriptures. You can tap any of the scriptures to see that passage or hit the read full chapter button to access the whole chapter. Okay, if you have any questions or would like a further explanation of how to use the app, we would encourage you to call or stop by the church office. Stuff because I was talking. I know you're surprised. I got to make sure you all know what's going on. Welcome to church today. The last two Sundays, right now, it was, Dustin, what was it? 90 degrees outside and 185 inside the church. It was hot. But we still worshiped, we still praised, and we did it in different languages. They did not understand us. It was a complete swap of what we are used to. But it was, so, it was not only so much fun, it was life-changing on many different areas of our life. And we will be covering that soon. For those who don't know, there were 17 of us that went to Montenegro, Colombia for two weeks. And we will be covering that. We'll be having a service coming up where we'll have a slideshow and different things happening. But I want you to know a couple things that are happening in the next few weeks. Number one, two weeks from yesterday, there is going to be a women's ministry luncheon. Is that what it is? It's in the afternoon. But that morning, there is a men's ministry breakfast going on. Did I say that right? What, Connie? We clean up very well. Steve does really good. And besides that, Richard is going to be on cleanup duty, and his wife is in charge of women's ministry. So we got that covered. That's all on the first Saturday in April. What we also have that day is an opportunity. There's a guy coming who is going to be, I believe it's at 10 a.m. that morning on that Saturday morning. He is going to come two weeks from yesterday. He is going to come and he is going to give you the opportunity. He is going to walk you through um, the opportunity to bequest the church. For those who aren't sure what that is, that's an opportunity for you when, when you pass away. Did somebody say my name? That's an opportunity for you to be able to pray through and see what God has for you when it comes to the church. And we want to give you that opportunity and allow you the ability to walk through that. It goes back to a, when we talked about legacy and what legacy do we want to leave. But between now and then, we have something that you know is coming, you've heard about, but it's kind of a big deal. How many of you have ever heard of this thing called Easter? Next Sunday morning is Easter, which means 
Friday night, 5.30 to 7, Good Friday service. 5.30 to 7, that's double the time it normally is. Correct, because we're doing it different this year. We usually have you come at 6.45 and we do a service here in the sanctuary. And we are, so to speak. But from 5.30 to 7, the doors will be open. We want you to come by yourself, you to come with your family, you to come with your friends, you to come with whoever you would like to experience Good Friday with. And as you walk in the front doors, Pastor Terry and I will be there and we will be directing you, showing you which direction to go. But throughout the hallways and throughout our sanctuary, we are going to have different stations that you will, interactive stations that you will be walking through, experiencing the crucifixion and walking through Good Friday. It's a little different than what we've normally done, but it's something we feel is important and want to give you an opportunity to do. Friday night, 5.30 to 7. You will then go home. You will have dinner. You will sleep tight because the next morning you're going to come and we're going to do the Easter egg hunt right outside with the barbecue, the, the hot dogs, the hamburgers. We're going to be um, having the playground open. We're going to be ministering to our community. What's that called? I think it's called belong. We're going to let people come and belong to a church when they think they really can't. That is at 10.30 Saturday morning. And then Sunday morning, we're throwing a party. We're going to have a breakfast, 9.30. We are then going to come in here, and we are going to throw the party of all parties that's going to end up with a few people getting baptized next Sunday morning. If you have not been baptized and you would like to, come talk to one of myself another pastoral staff member. We are looking forward to it. It's going to be the weekend of all weekends. The last thing you got is April 14th is a chili cook-off and pie auction. We are going to spend some time next weekend celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Today is Palm Sunday. It is good to be back in the house of the Lord with you. We are going to worship we are going to dive into the word. At this time, I want you to take a look at the screen. Okay, let me get this out of the way. I didn't steal that donkey, okay? I, I borrowed it. And, and it wasn't even my idea. Jesus told me to take it, to, to, to borrow it, right? Um, okay, this is this is how it happened. Um, earlier today, there was a large group of us, and we were traveling from Bethany to Jerusalem. We stopped just outside the city, and Jesus looked at two of us, and he said there was an unridden donkey just inside the village and asked us to go get it. He said if anybody, you know, asked us about it, we could just look at him and say, the Lord needs it, and he'll send it back. So the two of us beat it into town, and the whole time we were like, what is Jesus going to do with a donkey, right? But by this point, we realized you don't second guess Jesus, right? He hadn't told us why, and we didn't ask. We just got him a donkey. And when we got back, <laughs> that's, uh, that's, when it, uh, that's when it happened. Um, some people put their coats on the donkey, and Jesus got on the donkey. And um, <laughs> when he got on the donkey, <sighs> I don't know. It's like um, everyone started shouting and dancing and singing. And um, some people were throwing their coats in front of the donkey. There, there was, there was uh, some of us that grabbed some palm branches and we started waving them in the air. And that's when it clicked. Jesus had finally arrived. Um, I know that sounds weird. That's it. No, it's, it's like this. Um, in the past, we would get excited because Jesus would do something, a miracle, or he, there would be some parable, or something he said. We'd get excited about it. And Jesus would always be like, shh, come on, guys. No, 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 nope. 
just be quiet, you know? And then we'd come up with some idea, hey, let's do this or let's do that. And Jesus would, would be like, no guys, no, not, not now, not now. But today, <laughs> today was now. Today, he finally let us shout and sing and dance and treat him like the Messiah that we'd all been waiting for. He finally showed up. <laughs> ah, I don't know. Um, I don't know what tomorrow holds. Um, it feels like it's something big, but who knows, you know? But it doesn't matter what happens. Because Jesus showed up. And there... <laughs> There's nothing better than when Jesus shows up.
See 
something that we say in this space a lot as we gather to worship together is that we're going to raise one voice in worship. And really what that means is that we bring in all of our life experiences and backgrounds and all of the things that make us who we are. And that this space unites us. That our focus on Jesus unites us. And so we raise one voice in worship. And so we're going to embody a little piece of that this morning. We're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to sing in Spanish. And the reason that we gather to worship together, what our focus is, is that this space should reflect a little bit of what heaven on earth looks like, of what heaven's going to look like. And so in heaven, we're not, when we worship through song, there's not going to be one specific genre. There's not going to be one specific style of music or a, a specific language. We're going to be bringing all of those things in because all of those are worship. And so what we do in this space is we say, God, I'm bringing all of who I am. I'm, I'm bringing my heart to you. And so for some of us, English is our heart language. That's our first language. But for others of us, Spanish is our heart language. And so we're worshiping from our heart. We're saying, God, I bring all of myself to you. And then we get to a little glimpse of what heaven is really going to look like. whether we know what the words mean or not. A perfect example of this is next week we're going to come together and we're going to celebrate people getting splashed with some water. But it means so much more than that. And if you can perfectly explain what happens between that person and God in the moment where they get submerged in water and come back up, then that's awesome. Come tell us because uh, churches have been trying to figure that out for thousands of years. But even though we don't know exactly what happens, we know what the experience is. We feel the presence. We know the weight of that thing. And so when we worship together, even if we don't understand the words perfectly, we know what is being said because our hearts cry. It, it transcends language, right? It is humanity crying out to our Father, our God. So as we do this, lean into the uncomfortable. Maybe for you that's singing Spanish. Maybe for you that's singing English. Maybe for you that's going back and lighting a candle for somebody. Right? All of these things that we do throughout our services are all worship. It's not just the music. Everything is worship. Lean into it and let God work in your life in those areas that say, I'm just going to take a little step. And God's going to take it from there and run with it. And if you're still uh, concerned about it, you should talk to our missions team because they spent the last two weeks worshiping in Spanish. And there were um, two people on the team that spoke Spanish. And they still worship God with all their hearts. So we're going to learn what it means to be the body of Christ fully united no matter what language or culture we come from. So lean into it with us. And let's worship together.
Would you bow your heads as we come before our great God and Savior? Father, this morning we sing Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Father, we come this morning to worship the King of Kings. We come this morning to worship the God who saves us. Father, we are here this morning. We are here that just because at just the right time, while we were all wayward and wondering and wanting our own ways and wanting to be our own masters, Father, you came to earth and you gave your life for us so that we might be reconciled, so that we might come to you, so that we might know you as our personal Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So this morning, we say Hosanna. Father, we welcome you here. We welcome you to come to each one of us in a personal and vital and real way this morning. Father, you know us better than we know ourselves. We just open ourselves to you this morning. Do your work in each one of us. Father, we thank you for this time that we have had to worship you. Father, we love to come to this place to sing your praises, to, to proclaim that you are the Lord of our lives, that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Father, we pray for everyone in this congregation. We pray for everyone watching online. We pray for everyone who will later maybe stream this service. Father, would you just visit each person and would you come and would you fill them? Father, we pray for those in this congregation this week who are needing a physical touch from you. Father, we pray for each, for people here this morning that have loved ones that are ill that need a touch from you. We just ask for your divine touch on each person this morning. Father, we pray for Pastor Aaron as he will come in a few moments. Father, once again, would you anoint him from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Father, as he proclaims the message that you have laid on his heart for us today, would your Holy Spirit, just with his power, speak through Pastor Aaron. Father, open our hearts as we receive that word. Father, we just pray today that your will would be done on earth just as it, is, as it is in heaven. We thank you that you give each one of us what we need each day. Father, help us to learn to forgive those who have trespassed us. Father, as we have been forgiven by you. Father, guide and direct each word that is said this morning, each note that is sung, may it bring honor and glory to you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we pray these things in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, good morning. It's great to see each of you here today. Uh, would you take a moment and say hello to someone who you may not know? Kids, go ahead and go to your kids' zone. Just Hosanna, Hosanna.
Hello, hello, hello. Your time is up, people. That means stop being friendly. You can pick it back up again in 30 minutes or 17 or however long I go. Is it a good day? I gotta, I gotta tell you, we were, there was probably, there were 17 of us, so Dustin, what, 30 strong in church the last two weeks? 35 maybe? And we, we were worshiping in Spanish. You, some of you may have saw my video that I did live that they, uh, last week were singing Waymaker. It became very apparent after the song had been going, it was Waymaker. And I, I, I want you to know, they, they move a little bit more there than we do. And the interesting part is John Swanson learned how to clap on the beat finally. <laughs> Gary Humphrey realized his feet moved when the music went. And I won't tell you what the other people did. But I love worship. I love taking the time. I just get going and I get excited and I can't help but realize who Jesus is and what he's done for us. If you ever have a chance to go on a work and witness trip, I would say go. I said that before I went this trip. This was, I believe, I counted it out. I believe this was my 17th one. And it is amazing. So that being said, I said we'll get to that later on and we will. Um, just really quick, for those who weren't here at the beginning, Easter's this next week, Good Friday service, 5.30 to 7. Stations as you walk in, experience experience the crucifixion. C can I bring my kids? We want you to walk through it as a family. We want you to walk through it with someone else or by yourself, however you so desire, but it's set up to be done with others. Um, also, real fast, annual church voting is in the foyer. If you are an official member of South Salem NAS, don't forget to vote before you leave. Today, we are continuing on on this Palm Sunday, seven days before Easter. We are continue on, continuing on it with trust. And Pastor Terry, a couple weeks ago, talked about trusting when it's not easy, trusting in, in, when it's hard. And Pastor Shannon last week talked about building trust because you know what? You may be the only Jesus, someone else may see. You may be the reason, as he, as he said, as he gave his illustration and he said, um, why do you go to church? You're an atheist because I may not believe in this Jesus and this God, but my, I believe he said my mom does and that's good enough for me. When people don't believe the Bible, they may believe you. We need to be building up that trust in them. Today, we're going we're gonna to look in Luke chapter 23. And, and the question is, how do we even know that there is anything to this story of Jesus? You might be here today because you were drugged to church. I, I would find that interesting that we're seven days before Easter and you got drugged to church today. But you, you might be here going, uh, you know, who are these people even singing to? What are they clapping to? I mean, this Jesus, is he even real? Is it even somebody? Why in the world would anybody hear about following him? Why would anybody follow this guy by the name of Jesus, this first century rabbi? Why would anybody buy in to this whole thing anyways? Why would they grab a hold of it and change their life? How do we even know this whole Jesus thing is worth following? The whole thing rises and falls on Jesus, whether or not we believe he is who he said he was, or if we believe who some still think he is. It revolves around him, which means if you are considering Christianity, if you are reconsidering Christianity, if you are unconsidering Christianity, if you are deciding whether or not you really want 
to do this, then we need to understand that this whole thing rises and falls with one question. And, and the thing is, is the church hasn't done a great job of walking through this. By church, I don't mean South Naz, I mean the church in general, us included. Because the question really does come down to one thing. Does the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is it true? Is it something that really happened? I mean, it, we hear it all the time. They're different. They'll tell the same story, but they're different. Yeah, we understand its perspectives. We understand that people can be, and we can write, but the question really comes down to, is it true? How about I say this? If part of it were true, did you read the stories? Do you know what he's talking about? Did you hear everything Jesus did? What if part of it were true? If part of it were true, we should be standing up and going, hold on, I need more of this. Now, before anybody leaves this room and says, the pastor says only part of it's true, I believe the whole thing. But if you are questioning, maybe you should question a little bit more. Maybe you should walk through that a little bit more. Now, today we're going to look at the book of Luke and we're going to find out a little bit more about Luke himself. Now, Luke, the writer of the gospel of Luke, he's giving a personal account of everything that happened that he knows about. He's not even an eyewitness to all of it, but he did investigating and he found, he didn't just go, hey, tell me what you know about it. He actually dove in and he talked to people who were there and he investigated far beyond any of us ever have. And he came back and, and he gave us the book of Luke. In Luke chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, it simply says, many have undertaken to draw up account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the, who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Luke was just telling you everything he had learned and everything he knows from those people he trusts, from those people who say, I saw it. I was there. And Luke is writing that account up to make sure we all know. And what happened at the end of the story, Luke gets told everything. And Luke is telling you the end of the story makes the entire thing. It's not going to make any sense until you get to the end of the story. Just hold on. Because when you hear the end of the story, you're going to understand everything else that happened. So he's telling you, let's walk through this. Let's understand it. Let's hear it. Let's understand. And the context for everything that happens throughout the story is in Luke 23, 33, and 34. When they came to the place of the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Do you know that there is no account of the crucifixion? You don't see it in the gospels. Why? There was no need to. Everybody knew what it was. Everybody who lived in that time knew exactly what the crucifixion was. It was invented by Persians and perfected by the Romans. The idea was to keep a man alive as long as possible without killing him. Torturing him as long as possible until he finally died. It was terror on display, reserved mostly for criminals or political rebels, but never a Roman citizen. He, Luke did not have to describe it. Matthew, Mark, John, they didn't have to describe it because it was so well known. Everybody knew, and there's no need in rehashing it. There's no need in walking through it. And at this point, Jesus hanging up there on the cross with one criminal on his right, the other criminal on his left. He says something that is so unbelievably crazy. 
when you know what he's going through, when you understand what the crucifixion is happening. It made people around go, what in the world is he talking about? What in the world is he saying? Because when Jesus says this, he's actually telling you who he really is and how he really works through everything that's happening within him. And he's walking through it going, this is so powerful. It's so powerful, it's out in left field. And Luke, Luke, he wants you to understand that you have to hear this because it still won't make sense until we're at the end of the story. This is one of those statements that nobody would ever say. Nobody would ever want to say. It wouldn't even be your reaction. In the first century, it's not something that anybody would ever come out with. Not to mention the 21st century. Because there's not a one of us in the room that this would be our first thought without the end of the story. Jesus looks up. Verse 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Excuse me? You made me carry that cross. You flogged me. You whipped me. You beat me. You put me on as a human spectacle. You laid me down on the cross. You pounded nails through my hands and through my ankles. And now I'm going to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what you're doing. Do you hear yourself, Jesus? That's not what we say. If you're really who you say you are, just do it. Get down. Why are you forgiving them? Sound familiar? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then the next statement, and they divided up his clothes and cast lots. And they divided up his clothes and cast lots. Did he say something? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Did he say something? Ah, forget it. It's your role. Go. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. And they divided up. They ignored him. They kept going because that's not something anybody says. That's not something anybody does. Our actions only tell part of the story. Our reactions tell the whole story. Did you hear that? Because that's good. And I did not hear one amen. Thank you. Because I know it's a shock to your system. But your actions are only going to tell part of the story. We love to plan. We love to walk this through. We love to say, this is how it's going to happen. And that way I know every one of my actions. I know how I'm going to do it. And then a kink gets thrown into it. And all of a sudden we explode and we're yelling at our boss. We're yelling at our friend. We're yelling at our family. We're yelling, hey, I'm done. Your reactions tell the whole story. Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. And in one statement, Jesus summed up. Are you a follower or an admirer of him? Forgiveness is hard. Aaron, I I can do it. It's okay. I just never talk to them again or see them again. Right? I mean, that's kind of what we do in all honesty. Not in every situation, but in a lot. What's that look like? Because it's a struggle. And some of you right now have different things running through your mind. When we were in Columbia, we were talking one night in our devotion time. And one of the things that came up were the amount of kids that were coming around and um, hanging out where we were working and how they're good kids having a good time. We were having a good time with them. 
And we were just talking about how they were out and around and doing what they were supposed to be doing, going to school and doing this and that. And I couldn't help but wonder. And I don't know if there's any connection to it or not. I'm just telling you the way my mind went that night. And I picked up my phone and I checked the divorce rate in Colombia. It's the third least amount divorce rate in the world with 3%. And I read it because of me, I went, ha, I got the point. The parents are married, they're bringing up their kids, everything's great. But as I read along, it said something interesting to me. There's also a very high committing adultery rate in Colombia. But because of their beliefs, forgiveness happened and they do not get divorced. They stay married. I don't know. I don't know how well I could do that. That's a tough one for me. I know a lot of people who have. I know way more who haven't forgiven such things. But I will tell you that would be something that would pierce me. And that would be something that would be very, very, very hard for me to do. And I think most of you in this room agree with me on that. Even those who have, it's been a struggle. Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. In one sentence, Jesus summed up the difference between a follower and an admirer. Are you a follower or are you an admirer of Jesus? What is your reaction when circumstances come up? Is it that of Christ or is it that of get away from me? I'm going to do what I want and I'm going to do it the way I want it. What Jesus let us know, what Jesus actually made us understand in Luke chapter 9, that if we're a follower, in Luke 9, 23, is that not up there, Julie? There it is. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and what? Deny myself? Wait a minute. I want that. I deserve that. I've gone through so much. I need that. I deserve to have my life pan out this way. I'm going to go get it. It doesn't matter. That's what the world says. Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they know what they're doing. Must deny himself and take up his cross. How often? Daily. Daily. Every morning, every night, deny myself, take up my cross, and follow me, is what Jesus said. Not when it's comfortable. Not when I want to. Daily. And follow me. I have a gr- had a grandma. I nope. I take that back. I don't know how you word it. She passed away before I was born, so I don't know if I had a grandma or if it would have been. However, that works out. But I've heard many stories about her. In fact, she's the whole reason the Middletons even became Christians. In that, my grandma. Every single night, I was told she would kneel down by her bed and she would pray, Father, forgive me for the sins I committed today, even the ones I don't know I even did, which I thought was crazy. If you don't know you did it, then how is it a sin? That's me arguing. But if I'm going to pick up my cross daily and follow him, then maybe I need to admit who I really am and what I might have done and what I'm going to do. And I need to set myself aside. 
and set aside everything that's around me that I want, that I'm going to grab a hold of that's going to make me feel good for the next two days and then I have to go buy something else and I bet it's better. Let's hold on. Take a step back. What's following versus admiring look like? Because one day you may have said the magic words to accept Christ into your life and he's there and he's living there and you have forgotten all about him. And and it's okay because when I'm supposed to feel good, I follow and I do exactly what he says. But when it's tough and I don't want to feel that way, I'll just do my own thing. And I'm not, you know what? I'm going to pick up my cross every once in a while and follow him, but not daily because daily that's too much. I mean, that's like overachiever status and I've never been that way. So I'm just going to do it this way. Daily. And follow me. And Luke would look at you and if Luke, if you're at this point or you're at the point in Luke 9 or you're in Luke 23 and, and Luke's telling you the story and you went, time out. Wait a minute. This doesn't make sense. You're asking way too much. And this is just another man. He's another first century rabbi. Why do I even need to listen to what he says? Luke would go, you don't get it. I know the end. Keep reading you got to understand the whole story and find out who he really is. And when you do, you're going to go, oh, that makes so much sense. And this is still hard, but I want it. Verse 24. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. No, Jesus, you don't understand because it's all about what I can get. I'm the loser if I don't have enough. I know because I compare myself to everything that's not of you on a daily basis and it makes me feel terrible. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. Verse 25. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and let lose and yet lose or forfeit their very self? I'm going to have to forfeit my very self. I'm going to lose everything about me. I've done quite a bit of funerals in my uh, career. I was told by a friend of mine on one he did. And when it came time to ask, anybody have anything they want to say? Which I've done a funeral with this happened before. It always makes me nervous when there's an open mic because I remember the one that no one wanted to speak because they had nothing good. But my friend's funeral won up. Not only did nobody speak, do you know what the closing song was? I did it my way. Yes, you did. How'd it turn out for you? You lost it. You had nothing. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world? and let lose, yet lose or forfeit their whole life. Let's go back to Luke 23, verse 34. Or not back, we're going forward, Julie. But It's interesting what happened and came down here. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Remember, they just ignored him and kept going. Verse 35, and here's the kicker. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saves others. Let him save himself. If he is God's Messiah, the chosen one, if I may, if he was really God, if he was really Jesus, and he really loved me like everybody said he would, he would not allow me to go through what I'm going through because he's God, and he loves me, and everything's supposed to be great. He doesn't even exist. Hmm. The soldiers came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you 
are the king of the Jews. Save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Now I want you to hear this next part. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. I'm going to throw out a Hail Mary. And me, save me too. If you really are who you say you are, then do it. If you really are who you say you are, you better make sure you take care of me. Where does that fit in with daily picking up my cross and following him? Jesus made no bones about it. He said throughout the book of Luke, throughout the gospels, it's hard. It's difficult. Follow me. At some point, you might have said the magic words and accepted Jesus in your heart and you went on about the same way and nothing ever changed. Everything stayed exactly the same, but you were a Christian because you accepted Jesus. It's time to change. When are you gonna become all in? This man was crucified for you. And he's looking at you saying, pick up your cross daily and follow me. All the response these people who were there had was, really? This is who you say you are? Get off that cross. Come down. Do you know why Jesus didn't come down? You really want to know? Because if he would have, he would have ruined it for you and me. He was others first to the bitter end. Luke's telling you he's got it. Listen to him. Do what he says. Anybody know? When this crucifixion happened, when this all came to a head, Anybody know who the emperor of Rome was? Just by showing of hands. I knew Julie would raise her hand. His name was Tiberius Caesar. I saw one, two, maybe three hands. But everybody in this room and everybody online and everybody in America and 99% of the world knows the name Jesus Christ. The one who said, deny yourself daily, pick up your cross and follow me. The one who hung up on that cross and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He did nothing that ever contradicted anything he had done before. They were saying he was, you're the king. Get off the cross. Come on. And he said, nope. This is who I am. Verse 44. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. That curtain was 12 inches thick of stone. And when it dropped, you could enter the Holy of Holies. It was a signal saying, come on in. Verse 46, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. We did it! It's accomplished! But all those who knew him including the woman who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a different distance watching these things. The disciples, those who trusted him, those who were in it, they walked away. 
but they came back. And they changed the world because of telling what they saw, telling what they knew, picking up their cross daily and following him. At the end of the day, when the darkness fell, Jesus died with his arms wide open. Jesus died with his arms wide open. The cross took his breath away, but his death took my sin away. Luke would say, you haven't even gotten to the best part because the resurrection took all of our excuses away. But that's a story for another day. Do you know why I can trust Jesus? Do you know why I can trust everything he has said and everything he's ever done? And do you know why I can trust what Luke is telling me? What Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John have told me? I can trust him because of everything Jesus has already done. Stop spending so much time placing your trust in what he's going to do in you and look back at what he's already done and say, thank you, I'm in, I am following. I am no longer an admirer. I am no longer this person that has all the scripture knowledge up here. I have it here and I am going to pick up my cross daily and follow you no matter what it takes because you are Jesus and I'm not and I love you. As we enter this Holy Week, the week that we get to each and every day, look at what Jesus has done in us and what he's going to continue to do. May you commit to stop admiring what this man did. May you start following, picking up your cross daily and following him regardless of the outcome. Are you in?
fell out of the water. He turned it upside down. He made everybody look and go, what in the world is he doing? But then he died. And he came back. And he allowed each and every one of us, with his arms wide open, to be changed inside and out. The question for you is, are you willing to follow daily, pick up the cross, and follow Jesus? Only you can decide. Father, I thank you. I thank you for what you've done in each one of us. I thank you that you never leave us where we're at. You say, I love you right where you're at, and I'm taking you on. Father, help us to grab onto that, to continue to move in you, continue to walk with you daily, to daily pick up that cross, not set it aside, not be afraid, pick it up and follow you each and every step, even when it's going into territory that is unknown, that is scary, that it's different from where I'm at, where I'm comfortable at. I don't understand why you're moving me. I don't understand why you're taking me. Help us, Father, to jump into that and say, lead on, Father, we are in. Father, guide us each and every step that we leave the, as we leave this place each and every day as we approach the magical, wonderful day of Easter where you came back. We love you, Father, and we praise you. In that name we pray, amen. Hey, have a great week. We will see you Friday night, 5.30 to 7. Good Friday service. for joining us online today. We love the opportunity to worship together with you. If you are physically available, we would love for you to come and join us at 1045 on Sunday mornings. If you have any questions, if you need a prayer, go ahead and send an email to one of the pastors provided at the link below. We are the church that wants you to accomplish three things. We want you to belong, believe, and become. We want you to belong to a church, believe in Jesus Christ and his purposes, and become everything Christ designed you to be. Every six weeks, we provide our next steps classes, which are called Belong, Believe, Become. If you come and join us at 1045 on Sunday mornings, feel free to join one of our classes and find out who we truly are as a church and what we believe in. 